Tonight's presentation is Finding an Engine for Your Home Built. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated. He's an author for numerous aviation publications, holds a certified flight instructor certificate, A&P mechanics certificate with IA privilege, Aviation Maintenance Technician of the Year with the FAA in 2008 and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much. I'm going to turn control over to you. Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Tim, what are they doing for uh, for the 70th anniversary tomorrow? Are they serving free champagne throughout the building, or how's that going to work? We got something special planned. Oh, so, yeah, you got to tune into the first webinar. Jack and Charlie will be doing a special presentation at 1130 oh, wow. Central tomorrow morning. Very cool. Very, very mm -hmm. cool. Well, we glad to be with uh, 600 of my best friends here uh, to, to wrap up the day. Um, and um, we're going to be talking about finding an engine for your home build. I'm actually going to be talking about quite quite a bit about the, the engine for your home build. Uh, we'll um, be talking about uh, where to get an engine, what whether you, whether you want to buy a new or rebuilt engine or try to find a used one. Um, if you opt for a used one, how can you tell if it's a good one or a rust bucket and should you tear it down or, or or fly with it? We'll 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 talk about all of that stuff. And also, since since most home builders wind up getting their engine before they're ready to in, install it and and fly with it, how, how can we preserve the engine until the project is ready for first flight? Um, and when the time comes, then how how do you prepare the engine? Uh, uh, for that first flight uh, to test it, how to break it in. So we'll be we'll be covering a lot of territory. And the you know I, I I deal with a lot of aircraft owners and operators and a lot of engines, but the home builders present some special challenges that we don't usually see with certificated aircraft. And uh, one I, I I mentioned already that frequently the engine arrives earlier than you're ready for it. Um, and uh, so we, we need to take some special measures to make sure that the, uh, that the engine doesn't corrode or deteriorate while it's uh, sitting, uh, waiting for you to get the airframe to the point where it's ready to mount the engine and, and start it and, and, uh, and run it. And uh, then once you are ready, the, the, the second challenge is that um, the first flight procedures um, um, frequently are in conflict with optimum engine break-in procedures. So, so you've got to make some trade-offs there, and so we'll talk about all of that. But we'll start with with selecting an engine, and I thought a useful way to to deal with this would 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 be to to, to take a specific case and uh, see what what options are available. So uh, for the purposes of this discussion, let's, supposing, let's suppose you're building a, a, a Vans RV6A and you've decided you want to power it with a 200 horsepower Lycoming IO360 A1B6 engine. So what are, what are your options to, to find an engine for this RV6A that you're building? So to answer that question, I, I started uh, actually yesterday started looking around on various websites to find out what was available and the first place i looked is a company called air power inc down in texas it's the largest uh, distributor of lycoming engines and uh, they've got a real nice website where they list uh, the prices normally their prices are a little bit below lycoming's uh, list price um, and so I looked to see what it would cost to, to, to get an, uh, an IO360, uh, A1B6 from air power from the distributor. Cause you can't, you can't buy the engine direct from Lycoming. You have to buy it through a distributor. And for a factory new, um, IO360, A1B6, 
the price was a breathtaking eighty-two thousand five hundred ninety-eight dollars. Uh, that 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 even surprised me. That's that's a lot of money for a four-cylinder engine, I'll tell you. But that's that's what they're going for now. Um, so the the other thing that that you can get from from Lycoming is a factory rebuilt engine. And the factory rebuilt engine um, is just as good as a factory new engine. In fact, basically the only difference between a new engine and a rebuilt engine is is, is typically the warranty. That the new engine usually has a little bit longer warranty. But um, uh, the rebuilt engine uh, uh, was listed at $48,808. That's still pretty pricey, but it's a lot less than $82,000. In fact, it's it's the $33,000. Uh, seven hundred and ninety dollars less, but those prices aren't really com comparable exactly because when you buy a new engine, you buy it outright. When you buy a rebuilt engine, it's an exchange price. Uh, th they expect you to send them send in a core, um, and if you don't send in a core, um, you you wind up having to pay an additional $19,200, which is the core charge. Normally when you buy the rebuilt engine, they charge you $48,000 plus $19,000. And then when they receive your core back, they credit you back the, the $19,000. So um, if you didn't have a core and you were buying a factory rebuilt engine, you can do that but it won't cost you $48,808. It'll, it'll cost you um, well, let's see, whatever it is, 67,000 um, or $68,000, which is still less than $82,000. And I, I don't think I'd ever spend $82,000 on a new engine, it doesn't make any sense. But the, you, 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 you either are going to be paying the extra $19,000 or you're going to have to provide a core. Now, one of the good things about getting factory rebuilt engines is, is that the factory will pretty much take anything back as a core. They're, they're not real fussy about the condition of the, of the engine you send back. In theory, um, I, I think the fine print says that it has to have a serviceable case and a serviceable crankshaft. Um, in actuality, it's very, very rare that the factory is going to um, is 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 going to um, uh, withhold any of your of your core charge if you send them back an engine that looks like it's capable of of, of running. If you send them back an engine that has a connecting rod thrown through the side of the case, then they probably are going to not be willing to give you your full core charge. Although, uh, you know, I have experience with Continental where, where we sent back a core that had a rod through the side of the case and they gave, they, they credited 50% of the core charge back. Um, and that engine, of course, was, was a catastrophe. But most most of the time, if 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 it if it looks if if it's something that resembles uh, an, an engine, they'll they'll take it back and uh, and credit your your core charge. So those those are the two options from the Lycoming factory um, through Air Power, they're, they're the biggest distributor. But there's an, another interesting option because this happens to be a Vans RV6A that we're building and Vans has a special deal with Lycoming. Um, and Vans will arrange to, to sell you a, an uncertified version of the IO360A1B6 called a YIO360A1B6, um, which is literally indistinguishable from the certified engine, except for for the data plate and some of the paperwork, but it's a, it's the same engine uh, for a price of fifty one thousand one hundred fifty dollars, which is an awful lot better price than the eighty two thousand dollars. That's thirty one thousand dollars less. So it's it's a heck of a deal. Um, the if you want a new engine, it's a heck of a deal. Now the the one 
got you in in this is that vans will only let you buy this engine from them at this special price if you've previously bought an RV kit to put it on. So if you know if you're building a a, a cozy or a long easy or something else, you can't go to vans and and order this engine at this price. That's the, that's only for people who have bought a vans kit. But uh, if if you actually were building this RV six A, this this would be um, a heck of a lot better deal on a on a new engine uh, than if you than if you bought it through through air power. It's a special deal that Vans has. Um, so let's suppose that 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 these options we've talked about are a little bit above your budget and you want something a little bit less expensive. Well, another option would be to have an engine feel to find an engine and have it field overhauled. Um, and I looked around and, and not too many overhaul shops list prices on their website anymore. Most of them have most of them want you to call and uh, they'll give you a whole bunch of options and they'll quote prices over the phone, but most of them don't quote prices on, on their website. But um, an overhaul shop called Corona Aircraft Engines in Corona, California, down in Southern California, which I'm familiar with, it's um, a relatively low priced uh, field overhaul shop. They, they, they put out a pretty good product. Um, they, they did list some prices on their website. And uh, they will field overhaul an IO 360A1B6. Um, and they quoted two prices, one with overhaul cylinders and one with new cylinders, factory new cylinders. And the overhaul cylinders, the, the overhaul price is $30,650. With new cylinders, it's it's $6,000 more than that, $36,650. Um, and of course, to do this, you, you you have to send them a core engine. You have to send them something to overhaul. Um, and a field overhaul shop tends to be a little bit more picky about what you send them um, than the factory would on a if you in sending them a core for for a factory rebuilt engine, because the field overhaul shop actually has to take the engine you send them and overhaul it. And so the the worse shape the engine you send them, the more expensive it's going to be for them to overhaul it. So uh, typically the the prices they quote um, are, will require um, a, a serviceable case and a serviceable crankshaft and if they find something serious wrong with it they'll they'll probably upcharge you for um, for for the really seriously wrong thing that they found with it um, so if the engine is is halfway reasonable then then you can rely on the prices they quote if it if it if they if you send them back a real hunk of junk then they may say that they they may upcharge you um, for having to go the extra mile to to get to get this thing overhauled, um, so but but ha getting the engine field overhauled is in in, in is similar to uh, getting a factory rebuilt engine in that you you have to find a core first. Um, so where where are we going to find a core engine? So I decided I would go look on Trade Plane and see uh, what what sort of uh, IO 360A1 B6 cores might might be available for sale on Trade Plane, and there were actually quite a lot of them listed. Um, most of them said call for price; they didn't want to list a price in the ad. But I did find one uh, that was listed by a company called Dawson Aircraft Parts and Salvage um, in Arkansas. And they were offering a salvaged IO 360A1 uh, B6D for um, fifteen thousand three hundred dollars outright. The engine uh, had total time in service of a little over six thousand hours and time since major overhaul of a little less than fifteen hundred hours, so it was about three quarters of the way to TBO. Um, and uh, 
so what does the $15,300 buy you? Well, this is what it buys you. This is, this is one of the photographs they, they had. Um, and it's, uh, it's an engine, obviously, out of an aircraft. It's sitting on an old aircraft tire on a pallet. Um, and, um, and that's what it looks like. Um, now, let's see what we can figure out about about what this engine what this engine might might be like. Now, there's one th one thing about it that jumped out at me immediately, which I wasn't really fond of, which is the D on the end of the of the model number. This is a IO three sixty A one B six D, and a Lycoming engine that has a D at the end means that it is it's set up for the infamous dual mag, um, which uh, is not very well supported. And also, an engine that is set up for the dual mag is not one that you could like put some P mags on, or uh, it, it it really limits your choices as far as as far as ignition. Uh, I think it is possible to convert a D engine to a non D engine, but you've got to uh, buy a new accessory case and some different gears and stuff. So it's 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 a, a bit of a hassle. So I wasn't crazy about the fact that this one had a D at the end with the with the infamous dual mag. But I, I read the ad a little bit further and it gave some more information about this engine. And it turns out that this engine uh, got to Dawson. Uh, it was removed from a Mooney M20J due to a prop strike during a gear up landing. Um, now, why would they remove the engine from a Mooney because of a prop strike during a gear up landing? My guess it was an old enough Mooney that the insurance company decided that, that the gear up landing made it a constructive total loss and that they weren't prepared to repair the airplane. They just handed the owner a check and, and, uh, and, and took the airplane and sold it to, to a salvage yard. That's 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 my guess. Of course, it doesn't say that, but but why else would would this engine have been removed from a Mooney after a prop strike? Um, so it says the flange was dialed. It was only nine thousandths uh, out, uh, and and a die penetrant inspection was done um, on the uh, on the prop flange and the uh, and the flange base, and and there were no cracks to the flange or flange base. Um, you know, prop strikes, it, 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 the, the real question was whether it was a high powered prop strike or a low powered prop strike. Most uh, gear up landings are a low powered prop strike because the pilot thinks he's going to land, so he's throttled back. And low powered prop strikes almost never cause any sort of engine damage. The, the things that cause engine damage are high powered prop strikes, like if the guy hit, hears his propeller tips ticking on the runway and decides to apply power and, and go around, that 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 would be a high power prop strike and that would be very bad. But it mo was most likely a low power prop strike. Um, so last inspection date was um, was late uh, 2020, um, October of 2020. Uh, we don't know exactly when the gear up landing happened, but it would certainly happen within a year after that last annual inspection. So if, if it happened, let's say six months, then this engine has been sitting there on a pallet on a tire uh, for about two years. Um, not really interested in what the compressions were. <laughs> That's not really relevant. This is what was printed in the ad. So it's been sitting for two years on a tire on a pallet. And, and here's where it's sitting. Here's what Dawson Aircraft Parts and Salvage looks like. It's in Clinton, Arkansas. I don't know if it's named after Bill Clinton or, or whatever, but uh, it, uh, it's 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 a whole bunch of wrecked airplanes sitting outside in in Arkansas, which is uh, uh, not exactly the same as sitting in Tucson. It's uh, it's a fairly high humidity environment. So I, I would have to assume that this engine sitting outside in Clinton, Arkansas for two years is um, probably got some corrosion damage inside, wouldn't you think? So what, what do you suppose it would look like? Well, obviously I don't know exactly what this engine looks like, but here's, here's a, actually a Continental engine turns out that was, uh, uh, 
that was left to sit without um, being preserved, and we're going to be talking about preserving a little bit later. Um, and and it's interesting to see what exactly happens to an engine when it sits um, when it sits uh, in, in and and is exposed to the elements. And, and I'll take a little a little further close up on that so you can see a little closer. But it, it's interesting to see what part of the engine rusts and what part doesn't. And if you notice, um, the case, of course, doesn't rust. It's, it's aluminum. It's, it's going to be fine. The crankshaft, which is steel, um, has almost no visible rush, rust on any of the journals. What, what I'm seeing there are some water spots, but, but that, that those journals, the main journal and the, the rod journals would would polish out very easily and, and I'm sure would be just fine. There's a, some very, very light rust on, on, the, the, uh, on some of the, the, the cheeks of the, of the crankshaft throw, but um, you know, a little bead blasting would take that right off. So that crank is probably perfectly serviceable. Um, on the other hand, the cam is a massive rust. The lifters are a massive rust. And and the the uh, the connecting rods are a massive rust. Now, why does the cam? Why, why does the crankshaft look so good? Well, the crankshaft looks so good because it wasn't sitting out in the elements. It had bearing shells around all those journals. I mean, this was partially disassembled to see what it looked like after it sat out. But a, a, an engine that's assembled has bearing shells over the the main journals and the rod journals which hold uh, um, oil film against those for a long, long, long time. The, the oil doesn't get a chance to strip away. And so the journals typically look, look pretty good even after the engine's been sitting for a while. So the chances are real good that, they, that, that even though this engine be sitting for two years, that, that the crank is probably okay. And the case is almost certainly okay. But almost everything else in the engine that's made of steel is probably in in in, in terrible shape. It's, it's probably probably non-reusable. Um, so that would make the, the engine probably a pretty good viable candidate to be a core to at least, for example, against a rebuilt engine, because really all Lycoming cares about is whether the crank's okay and the and the case okay. They don't care about the rest of the stuff. They're going to throw it away. Um, the overhaul shop would be a little bit pickier, but again, most of the time, the, the main upcharge risk is if there's a problem with the, with the case, you know, like a crack or a problem with the, uh, uh, with the crankshaft not being reusable. So if, if we bought this engine for $15,000, would you, would you, put it on the airplane and, and, and fly behind it? Probably not, because you know it's been sitting out there for two years. If it was sitting out for two years in, in Tucson, Arizona, or Denver, Colorado, or something like that, where it's an arid climate, then it probably would be okay to fly behind. But if it was sitting for two years in Arkansas, uh, or, or God forbid, a place like Florida or South Texas or something where corrosion is just like horrible, um, you, you definitely wouldn't want to fly behind it. it, it you, you'd either have to have it overhauled or you'd use it as a core to, to trade in on a, on a rebuilt engine. Um, okay, now I, I do want to mention one other possibility, although I'm not sure it's still available, um, but I, thought, I always thought it was really cool. And that is that uh, the idea of buying your engine as a kit and building it yourself. The, the um, uh, superior air parts down in Texas and Aerosport Power up in, uh, I think it's Kamloops up in, in Canada, um, both operated uh, an engine build school where, where you could go and, and under supervision uh, build your engine, and which to me would be just an absolutely phenomenal learning experience. Um, I'm sure that they both were shut down um, because of COVID, the, the, the schools, and I'm not sure if they've 
reopen. So I'm not sure whether this is an option right now or not, but it, it certainly was an option prior to the COVID lockdown. And to me, this would be like an ultra cool option for for engine for a home build. It would would be to to buy it essentially in kit form and then go to one of these build schools and uh, and build it under supervision. I, I don't think you could you'd save any money that way. I, 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 it, it, it probably costs them more to supervise you building it than it would be for them to build it themselves. Um, but the amount of, of knowledge that you would gain, uh, I think would be absolutely invaluable. So if, if these things are an option, maybe during the Q&A, maybe somebody knows whether either Superior or Aerosport Power or both have reopened their build schools. I really don't know. Uh, they, they, they both show up on the website, but, uh, but I can't see any evidence that they've been you know, graduating any students lately. So I'm, I'm not sure if they really have reopened yet, but to me, this would be a, a really cool option for, for, for getting an engine for a home build. Um, okay, so anyway, we, we talked about the fact that piston aircraft engines just hate to sit unflown. Um, they're, 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 uh, they're quite vulnerable to corrosion. And new engines are much more vulnerable to corrosion than, than uh, engines that have been in service because engines that have been in service tend to have a, a layer of protective varnish built up on, on parts that makes them a little less likely to rust than, than a brand new engine um, or, a, or a freshly overhauled engine or a freshly rebuilt engine. Uh, those uh, um, engines that, that, that have all new parts in them that haven't really been run or have only been run you know, for an hour on the test cell or something like that are, are exquisitely vulnerable to corrosion. So um, it, it's obviously a good idea not to take delivery of, of, a, of a, an engine until you're ready to, to put it on the airplane and fly. Uh, in the real world, that's very hard to do. Um, you know, lead time on these engines have, have been quite ridiculous lately. Um, if, you, if you ordered a, a, a new engine from Lycoming, you'd be lucky to get it in, in nine months. Um, builders tend to always underestimate when they're gonna be ready. <laughs> so they tend to, tend to get the engines too soon for that reason. And you know nobody wants to finish a build and, and then have to sit around waiting for an engine to show up. So the, in the real world, Engines tend to arrive before um, they're ready to, to to go on the airplane. So if your engine arrives before you're ready to uh, ready for it, which is typically the case, you, you need to take heroic measures to preserve it. So let's talk a little bit about preserving the engine once you get it. Um, and there, there are really two things that I recommend doing. One is what's called pickling the engine. And the other is using an engine uh, dehumidifier. Um, the pickling the engine um, is covered. Uh, Continental uh, has has a procedure in in their um, standard practice maintenance manual M0. It used to be a service bullet, but now it's in their standard practice maintenance manual M0. Lycoming has a service letter um, uh, that that talks about the the pickling procedure. Both of them pretty much are identical. Um, and if you go on aircraft spruce, you'll find that, the, that you can buy a pickle kit uh, that Tannis makes. Uh, you can buy a four cylinder or six cylinder pickle kit um, that has pretty much all you need to, to pickle the engine. Um, and, and basically what's, what's in there is um, some light aerosol, lubricant that you can, uh, uh, anti-corrosive lubricant uh, that you can spray in, in the cylinders, um, a set of desiccant plugs that replace the top spark plugs and absorb moisture uh, in the combustion chambers, um, uh, some anti-rust oil uh, that uh, uh, sticks like glue to, to anything that it touches and is very good for preserving Expensive bottom end compo uh, components, uh, you know, cam and crank and connecting rods and all of that stuff. Um, the, uh, Phillips makes a product called anti rust oil. Uh, uh, 
Shell makes a similar product with the with, with, with the uninspiring name Aeroshell Fluid 2F. <laughs> I don't think that one went through their marketing department, but in any case, both of those are good preservative oils. Um, sometimes we'll use just regular operating oil with a double dose of cam guard in it, which also makes a pretty good pickling oil. But you you, you want to put something in the engine that that will um, stick to the parts and and keep a protective film on them a lot longer than normal operating oil. Uh, the pickle kit typically. <clears throat> include some bags of desiccant that you shove up the the uh, the the intake and the exhaust and some duct tape to to seal up the intake and the exhaust and the breather and any any other orifices that the engine has to prevent um, moisture from getting into the engine. So um, the, all, doing all of this stuff is is what's referred to as pickling the engine, and it's it's quite an easy easy procedure. It's kind of like a glorified oil change really but you're using some special products to uh, to keep the engine uh, preserved uh, the other thing that that I think is a really good idea if, if the engine is going to be sitting for a while and if it's sitting someplace where where you have electrical power is to use an engine dehydrator um, uh, there are a couple of them that 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 are available Tannis used to make one they don't make one anymore um, but there's a unit called the engine saver which is quite inexpensive i, I think it's about 200 bucks and it, it basically consists of a, a little air pump that's kind of like a a, a a um aquarium pump that kind of thing that 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 pumps a small volume of air through a jar that is full of desiccant crystals that that dries the air out and then the 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 dehydrated air that's essentially zero percent humidity air um, goes through a hose that's attached to the engine it, it, and it, it either is attached to the engine breather or um, sometimes the oil filler port but but basically what it's doing is it's it's putting a slight positive pressure of air continuously into the engine and and it's zero humidity air uh, which basically displaces any moisture uh, that's in the engine and, and keeps it in a in a, a low humidity environment um, internally. Um, the other one, the one on the right, is called a Black Max. It's about 500 bucks, I think. Um, and instead of using desiccant crystals, it it actually refrigerates the air, so it it dehydrates it in the same way that a room dehumidifier would 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 do. Um, and the advantage of the Black Max is it doesn't have any consumables. The the engine saver, those desiccant crystals only are good for um, a, a period of time, you know, maybe a couple months at most. And then you either have to replace the desiccant crystals or you have to take them home and put them in the microwave oven and then dry them out and then put them back in, into the uh, dehydrator. Whereas the Black Max doesn't have any consumables, so it'll, it'll just dehydrated air going 24 seven without you having to do anything except provide electrical power to it. But anyway, pickling the engine uh, and um, uh, and using an engine dehydrator are two really good ways to, to prevent that engine from getting damaged while it's sitting waiting to be installed. So you, you finally get to the point where the engine is ready to install and, and, and we have to prepare it for its first flight. And the key to preparing an engine um, after it's been sitting for a while is to pre-lubricate it. Um, because we, we, when, we, when we first start the engine, we don't want everything to be dry in, inside. Now, um, the, the, unfortunately, the engine manufacturers don't design these engines to make them particularly easy to, to pre-lube. Um, so, uh, doing it in, involves a, a, a number of steps, and um, there there are variations on this, but this is more or less what I would recommend. So, when, when preparing the engine, we we remove the top spark plugs, or if if you pickle the engine, you have desiccant plugs. Remove the desiccant plugs, um, and rotate the prop to bring each piston to bottom dead center. 
to so maximize the size of the combustion chamber, and then fog each cylinder with uh, with a, 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 a light penetrating lubricant that, that can be fogged in, in there so it'll, it'll reach all the surfaces and coat them. Um, I, you can use a, a variety of, of, of light uh, oils. Um, I, I like this, uh, this sprayer that, that, that you can buy on Amazon called a, a Solo 418, it's 17 bucks. And you, you put some light lubricant in it and then you pump it up with a, with a hand pump and, and then, it'll, then it will it'll spray that lubricant at high pressure in, in, in a very fine mist into whatever you point the nozzle at. So to begin with, we're gonna be pointing the nozzle into the top spark plug hole of each cylinder and filling up the combustion chamber with a fine mist of, of oil. It can be aerocroil, it can be LPS2, it can be ACF50 or Corrosion X, whatever, whatever floats your boat. But we wanna put some lubricant uh, and fog it into each cylinder so that the cylinder walls are, 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 are coated and won't, won't be dry when we first start the engine. And then we want to fog this stuff every place else we, we, we can get into the engine, through the engine breather, through the engine um, oil filler port, um, to try to get as much lubricant fog into the crankcase as we can, and to get some lubricant on, on the camshaft specifically. On the cam and uh, and and, uh, and lifters. Um, now, with the spark plug still removed, um, we want to uh, we want to crank the engine with a starter. Um, you can you can do this with a preservative oil if you want, because the preservative oil is actually authorized to, for for flight. Or you can drain the preservative oil and put in your, your break-in oil, which is probably what would make sense here. Um, but we, we, we wanna crank the engine and, and to, to the point where we can generate some oil pressure because we wanna get, we wanna pre-lube the, the main bearings and the rod bearings and, and, and try to get some, some more oil on the cam if we can. Um, now, the, the starter motors are, uh, are, are not uh, rated for continuous duty. They're, they're not supposed to be run for more than about 30 seconds at a time without a cool down. And 30 seconds is probably not gonna be enough to generate oil pressure. So uh, you, you wanna crank the starter, again, with the spark plugs out so that there's no compression. Um, you wanna crank the starter for uh, 30 seconds, then let it cool for, for a couple minutes, then crank it again for 30 seconds and re re lather, rinse, repeat until you start seeing oil pressure on the gauge. Uh, when I've done this, I've actually been able to get oil pressure in, into the green arc. I, I can't guarantee that that, that 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 will be the case with, with every engine, but you wanna, you wanna crank it until you get the measurable oil pressure on the gauge and, and, and get it up as high as you can so, so that you have thoroughly pre-lubricated um, everything that's pressure lubricated in the engine and hopefully done a little bit of splash lubrication at the same time. So once you're finished with all that, you, know, you, you can in, in install the spark plugs and, uh, and you're ready for the first start. Uh, talking about the first start, we wanna be kind of careful with this first start. Um, again, remembering that the engine is only marginally lubricated. So we, 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 wanna, we wanna be pretty cautious um, about this first start. Uh, for one thing, you wanna use as little priming as you can, because you don't wanna wash off the, the pre-lube that you just carefully put on, on all the cylinder walls. And if you over prime the engine, that the fuel's gonna wash the, 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 uh, the, the oil um, off, off the cylinder wall. So use as little priming as you can to get that first uh, start done. Um, and once the engine fires, uh, resist the urge to rev it up, uh, let it run for a while at minimum idle RPM, which is typically somewhere between six and 800 RPM and, and let it, let it run at minimum idle RPM for at least a minute or two. 
to make sure that that there's splash oil uh, on on everything. Um, the the, um, uh, the 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 stress on on uh, bearings uh, goes up with uh, something like the square of the RPM. So uh, we we want to make sure everything is really well lubricated before we start adding RPM. Uh, so once the engine is idled for a few minutes um, at, at minimum RPM, then, then you can cautiously throttle it up uh, to, to higher RPMs to eventually get up to run up RPM. Um, and we, we don't want to do this for, for any longer than necessary for reasons that I, I will get into in a minute when we talk about break-in. We, we really don't want to ground run this engine more than about five minutes um, at, at low power. Uh, so within about five minutes after you start the engine, shut it down, remove the cowling and, and go over everything with a fine tooth comb looking for oil leaks. But don't do a protracted low power operation. Uh, we, we, that's what we're, we're, tr we're trying to avoid. Um, but we do want to do an oil leak check. So. Started, started gently, run it at minimum idle, bring the RPM up a little bit, and, and within about five minutes, shut the engine down and then go over it for, for leaks. Um, if, if you don't find any leaks, then, then we're ready to do something serious with this engine. And what you do in the first hour of operation is, is, is really super critical. And here we're dealing with this problem that First flight procedures uh, typically conflict with optimum break-in procedures because first flight procedures tend to be very, very cautious and break-in procedures require running the engine hard. And how, how do you rationalize the two of that? Well, it's, it's, it's difficult. It, it's definitely a conflict and you have to make a judgment, um, you know, what, what I would do might be a little different than what you would do, but everybody's got to got to make a decision on this that that keeps them within their comfort zone and everybody's risk tolerance and so on is a little bit different. But before you decide how you're going to handle this, um, let's talk a little bit about engine break in and what the what the challenge is there. Um, because you paid a lot for this engine and you don't want to ruin it during the first hour. so. We, we need to be kind of careful about how we how we treat it. Um, the, the, these engines, whether it's a Continental or a Lycoming or, or a Volkswagen or whatever, that they they have a aluminum cylinder heads that are mated with hardened steel barrels uh, with an aluminum alloy piston running up and down inside. And the piston has at least three rings uh, on it, sometimes four. Uh, the, starts out with two compression rings, um, number one, number two compression ring, that, whose job it is to, to, to keep combustion gases in the combustion chamber and try to prevent them from, from, from getting past the piston and, and in, into the crankcase. Um, every, anything that gets by the compression rings is, is referred to as blow-by, and we're trying to keep blow-by to a minimum. Now, compression rings aren't all that efficient, and, and they, 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 they typically only are able to keep about 80% of the gas contained, which is why we have two of them, so that the 20% that, that gets past the first compression ring then has to deal with the second compression ring, and it blocks 80% of it, so what the, the blow-by is only 20% of 20%. Um, the third ring, is, which is a slotted ring, is called the oil control ring, and it, it has nothing to do with, with, with sealing. Its job is to spread lubricating oil on the cylinder walls as the piston goes up and down uh, to, to keep it lubricated. Um, so as, as, as the piston goes up and down inside the barrel, um, it, it's, it's very important that there be an oil film on the cylinder walls. Um, on which those compression rings can hydroplane uh, so that they don't actually, so that there isn't actual metal to metal contact between the rings, which are typically chrome plated, very, very hard, 
And the cylinder wall, which is normally a, a hardened steel surface, um, if the if there is metal metal contact between the rings and the cylinder wall, it will wear out the cylinder. The, the rings are typically a lot harder than the cylinder. Um, and we're trying to minimize wear, so uh, we have to keep them separated with, with the film of lubricant. Um, and hydrodynamic lubrication as the piston goes up and down. Now, when the cylinder is originally manufactured, it's it the the barrel is 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 basically um, um, it comes out of a CNC machine, and when it comes out of the machine, the barrel is initially uh, has a mirror smooth finish, uh, and a mirror smooth finish is not going to work because you can't coat a mirror smooth cylinder barrel with a with a thin film of oil. If you try to do it, what happens is that the oil beads up and it, 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 you just can't keep a thin film of oil on a on a on a, a perfectly smooth uh, cylinder bore. Um, and and uh, the engineers say that the, the, that the cylinder is is non oil wettable. Well, we need to make it oil wettable um, in order to get this lubrication right. So the way they what they do is they after they after this the cylinder comes out of the CNC machine with a with a nice shiny smooth barrel, they roughen the barrel uh, in order to make it oil wettable, and it's accomplished using a hone that has some very hard 220 grit stones that sw swirl around. Um, the, the 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 hone is rotated with a like a something like a drill a power drill and it and it's it's slid in and out of the cylinder and it creates this crosshatch pattern of very very tiny scratches that are just enough to give the barrel enough roughness that it becomes well wettable uh, these scratches are are extremely fine um, they're frequently called micro finish because the the scratches are, are typically only about 30 millionths of an inch deep, very, very tiny scratches. But if you looked at this with a very, very powerful microscope in cross section, what you'd see is that the, this, this hone creates this series of peaks and valleys, these scratches um, on, the, on, on the cylinder walls. Um, the valleys are what we want to make the cylinder oil wettable, it, 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 these little scratches basically give the oil kind of a foothold to hang onto the cylinder wall instead of beating up. <clears throat> it's the peaks that are problematic um, because if the, those, those peaks are going to um, uh, cause metal to metal contact with the rings and to cause the cylinder to, to wear and, 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 uh, and run hot. And so the purpose of the of break-in is 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 to basically round off those peaks uh, while leaving the valleys intact and result in an oil wettable surface that um, that, that 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 doesn't have excessive friction and doesn't run uh, overly hot. Um, so what we're trying to do in break-in is almost the exact opposite of what we try to do. Uh, during normal engine operation. During normal engine operation, the goal is is to have the the cylinder walls lubricated with oil that is sufficiently, you know, a film that's sufficiently strong and, and thick that it prevents the rings from contacting the, the cylinder wall and, and, and eliminates metal to metal contact. But when we're doing the break-in, we actually are trying to achieve metal to metal contact and uh, in order to basically grind off those peaks with with, with the the chrome plated rings and so that says that we have to do things differently during break-in than we would during normal engine operation um, and in order to to, to get the break-in done correctly we have to run the engine as hard as we possibly can because it is the combustion chamber pressure that is what pushes the rings 
against the cylinder wall. The, the rings um, have a, a semi-trapezoidal shape uh, that is designed so that the gas pressure um, actually pushes them against the cylinder wall. And the, the greater the gas pressure in the combustion chamber, the, the, the harder those rings are pressed against the cylinder wall. So for break-in purposes, we want them to be pressed as hard as we possibly can against the cylinder wall in order to breach the oil film and, and be able to, to round off these, these peaks from, from that the home made. Um, and so we need to run the engine really hard uh, dur during the first hour or two in order to get this accomplished. It's also important that we use an appropriate oil. Um, we, we don't want the oil film to be uh, very um, strong because our, our goal is to try to, to breach that oil film and, and to get metal to metal contact during this, this couple hours that we're doing the break-in. So we want to use kind of a, a mediocre oil. Traditionally, uh, what's used for break-in, what's been used for break-in since World War II or something, is what's called straight mineral oil, which is basically dead dinosaurs with, with no synthetics in it, no ashless dispersants in it, no anywhere, any scuff additives, no viscosity index improvers, which is the thing that, that multi-grade oil has in it. Um, it it's, it's just plain ordinary dead dinosaurs with, with almost no additive package. Um, now, in, in, in recent years, some of the manufacturers have been going away from using straight mineral oil for break-in, and they'll, they'll, use, they'll recommend using AD oil, in some cases, multi-grade oil. But the things that we definitely don't want during break-in are, are, are two things. We don't want any synthetics because synthetics create a much stronger uh, film and our purpose is to breach the film. So we don't want any synthetics in our oil. We want just plain ordinary petroleum based stock. And we don't want any anywhere or any scuff additives, any friction modifier additives in, in our oil because we're trying to actually generate friction during the break-in period. That's the whole purpose of it. Um, so we, we we need to avoid um, anywhere additives and synthetics. So these are things we would definitely not want to use during during the break-in period. Uh, the, the first one is Aeroshell 15W50, which is a semi-synthetic oil with, with a bunch of anti-scuff stuff in it. <laughs> the second one is Aeroshell W100 Plus. That doesn't have any synthetics, but it does have it does have a bunch of anywhere additives in it. We wouldn't want to use something like CamGuard, which is a really excellent um, aftermarket additive that, that, that I've been using for a long time in my airplane. But it's not something you'd want to use during break-in because it's it's got a whole bunch of friction modifiers in it, and we, we don't want those during break-in. And the last one is uh, is the Lycoming LW16702, I think is the number. It's the Lycoming snake oil. <clears throat> That they use in a lot of, they recommend using a lot of their engines. Actually, in in the H2AD, the O320 H2AD, it's required by Airworthiness Directive that you use it. But again, it's it's a it's a friction modifier. It's a it, uh, so you wouldn't want to use it during break-in. So, you know, all of these things are 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 fine to use in your engine, but wait 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 until you've got 10 hours or 25 hours on before you start using this stuff because because they're exactly the wrong thing for break-in. So we want to use the right oil. We want to run the engine hard, but how hard should we run it? Well, most of the manufacturers have these service bulletins that give these complicated procedures that say run it for 75% power for a certain amount of time and 65% power for a certain amount of time. Um, all, all of these manufacturers' recommendations are, are, are predicated on the notion that you don't have very good engine instrumentation and you don't know what's going on with the engine. Um, nowadays, we mostly have very good engine instrumentation. And ideally, what we'd like to do is run the engine. I mean, to get the break-in done as fast as possible, we'd run the engine 100% power the whole time, except that we have to be careful 
not to overheat these cylinders. So what we really want to do is run the engine as close to 100% power as, as, as we can get away with, but without over-temping the cylinders. So if you, if you have um, an engine monitor, uh, either a, a separate instrument or this is a, a Dynon MFD with, a, with the engine page, but if you have something that lets you see the cylinder head temperatures of each of your cylinders, that's really what, what we need for this purpose. Then what I recommend is, is run the engine as close to maximum power as possible um, without allowing any of the CHTs to exceed these limiting temperatures. For continental cylinders, don't let the CHTs get above 420. For Lycoming cylinders, don't let them get above 440. Run the engine as hard as you possibly can, um, but with limiting um, cylinder head temperatures to, to these temperatures. And if you do that for an hour or two, you, you basically will have accomplished almost all of the, the break-in. Um, and you can get on with the, with the rest of your business. Um, of course, you know, if, if, if you don't have um, engine instrumentation that lets you monitor cylinder head temperatures for each cylinder, then you can't do this. And you might just have to follow the manufacturer's guidance, which will tend to prolong the break-in period because it's much more conservative than this. But if you do have um, an engine monitor where you can really see what's going on, then you wanna run it as hard as you possibly can um, uh, without over-temping the cylinders. And if you do this for an hour or two, uh, you will see the CHTs come down on those cylinders, and that's kind of your clue that the break-in is largely complete. The, the other thing you're looking for is that oil consumption stabilizes. But but if you if if you can run the engine really hard uh, for an hour or so, uh, you will see the cylinder head temperature start to come down, and that'll tell you that 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 you've been successful in breaking in the engine because the cylinder head temperatures come down because the the friction um, has has gotten reduced because those sharp peaks in, of the home pattern have been smoothed off. That's the whole idea. Now, you know, one 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 problem is, you know, if if uh, assuming that your engine is normally aspirated, doesn't have a turbocharger in front of it, to run the engine close to maximum power, you're going to have to do it at a relatively low altitude. Um, if if you if you're building your RV6A. Uh, at an airport that's uh, 6,000 feet MSL, it's going to be hard to 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 break in the engine uh, very well because even at full throttle up there, you 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 know you're only going to be getting 70% power or something like that. So um, if 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 you were breaking in an engine based in Denver, probably the best way to do it is to is to point the airplane east and fly to Kansas. <laughs> So that you can get down to a to a, to a lower elevation and, and and get a little bit more manifold pressure and a little bit more power, it, it's hard to to do good break-in when you're up at a high altitude airport. Um, we want to keep ground running to a minimum. Um, a, a, a avoid a protracted run-up. Don't cycle a prop any more than necessary if you have a controllable pitch prop. Um, uh, the, the problem with running freshly honed cylinders at low power for any longer than necessary is the possibility of glazing the cylinders. What, what happens is if you run the engine at low power, um, the, the rings aren't being held against the cylinder walls very tightly. And so there's a lot more blow by. Um, and that blow by will gets hot. It's the, the oil gets, the, will, will get hot and turn into varnish that, that will plug up the, the micro finish and pr prevent you from, from breaking it in. Um, and we want to avoid that. So, um, so until the break-in process has been done, which really should only take an hour or two, um, we, we want to keep a low power operation to an absolute minimum. Uh, here's a diagram that I did is not not exactly to scale, but but it tries to illustrate the point that, that the left panel shows 
a freshly honed cylinder with, with really sharp peaks on the hone pattern. The middle panel is what we're striving for, which is to round off those sharp peaks. Uh, that's, that's what we do when we break in the cylinder properly. And the right-hand panel is showing the, what happens if, if you allow the cylinder to get glazed, uh, where, the, where the micro finish gets plugged up with, with, with carbonized oil and basically stops the break-in process in its tracks. And if that happens, um, the, the, the cylinder will, will burn a lot of oil. And the only um, solution is to pull the cylinders, rehone them, and start the process all over again. You really don't want to do that. So we're trying to avoid glazing. And the way to do that is to minimize low power operation, minimize ground operations. Um, so the basic three basic rules for, for break-in is use the right oil, no, no synthetics, no friction modifiers. Uh, run the engine as hard as you possibly can without overtemping the cylinders and minimize ground operations. If you do those three things, the, the break-in should be successful and typically will only take an hour or two at, two at the most. And you'll know when it's, when it's been successful because the cylinder head temperatures will come down noticeably. Now, you know, the question is how, 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 how can you minimize low power operations like we we're talking about prior to first flight without compromising safety? Um, that's a very controversial subject. Um, um, I'll give you my thoughts about it, but not everybody agrees. Um, first of all, you, you want to consciously minimize the time that you spend at, at, at idle power um, before the, the break-in flight. Um, you're going to have to do a run-up, do it at relatively high power, um, and, and don't make it any longer than necessary. Um, I'm a big fan for prior to first flight of doing high speed taxi runs, which is basically going out to the runway and applying full takeoff power and and just acting like you're going to take off except that you that that you reject the takeoff be, before you get to liftoff speed. So you you're able to run the engine at 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 at, at full takeoff power. Which is which is good, um, and without leaving the ground until you're, you know, confident that 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 you have good directional control and that the controls feel right and all of that stuff. Um, not everybody thinks high-speed taxi uh, runs are a good idea. I I personally think they were uh, they're a, a very good idea. Um, the um, uh, also how well you can do those depends on how long a runway you have. I mean, my the airport that I'm at is an 8,000 foot runway, so I can, I can do an awful lot <laughs> on, on that runway before I, before I have to abort and, and, and run out of runway. Um, but, but then, you know, you, you, you will have a, a, a protocol written down about what you're supposed to do during the first few flights of the airplane. And they'll probably be, uh, in, you know, inv involve uh, stalls and, and checking um, control authority and, and finding out what VX and VY are and all sorts of stuff that, that is not really compatible with, with break-in. So uh, if it were me, and not everybody thinks this way, but if it were me, I would consider doing a one hour high power break in flight uh, with the airplane in, in hopefully in the vicinity of the airport, just in case that something goes wrong, you need to put it back down on the ground before you start going through the, the that initial flight test protocol. Um, if, if you can do an hour of, of high power flight, you, you'll have gotten gotten the break in behind you. Uh, and the the engine will then then you can do whatever you want with the engine and and uh, go through all of that protocol. If you do the flight test protocol first, there's a really good chance you're going to screw up the break in and run the risk of, of of having to having glazed cylinders and having to pull the cylinders and rehome them, which we which nobody really wants to do. 
so um tim that's <laughs> that's all i have prepared um anybody who wants to learn more about engines uh i would recommend my my engine book it's it's only 500 pages long uh you can get it at the uh, the ea bookstore online you can get it from aircraft spruce you can get it on amazon and i'm happy to report that we're about two-thirds of the way through um, recording the um, audiobook version of, of this engine's book. It was a big project, um, but I expect to have it completed uh, within about a month. We, we should have it up on Audible for people who like audiobooks. I'm, I'm a big audiobook fan. So we'll have the audiobook version of the engine's uh, book available uh, probably in about a month. Um, and with that, uh, we can open up for any questions. All right, Mike, we're about at the end of our time here. Let's try and get a couple in at least. Richard was wondering, can you do an engine cylinder break-in on the ground if the cylinder head temperatures are maintained below the maximum allowed? Um, I, I would consider that pretty abusive. It, you, I, I don't like running engines at high power on the ground because you basically don't have any 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 significant cooling air passing over the the cylinders, and um, uh, so it's it's very unlikely that that you can keep cylinder head temperatures under control at high power. And even if you even if you could, the 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 cooling of the cylinder barrel is likely to be very uneven uh, because of the the poor cooling airflow, and so you're likely to get an out around condition that would that that would kind of mess things up. So I really would not recommend trying to trying to trying to break in a, an, an engine on the ground. It's it, they're air cooled engines; they need a lot of air, and and you just can't get that when you're when you're ground running the engine. Lee was wondering: Is the break in period the same for nickel plated or chrome plated cylinders? That's a great question. Um, for nickel carbide uh, cylinders, uh, break in tends to be very 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 quick. Um, the, the nickel carbide cylinders have have little synthetic diamond fragments in, impregnated into the nickel plating um, that that really acts kind of like a like a grinding compound, and they typically have special compression rings that are quite soft, and uh, that uh, and and the break in is it tends to be very very rapid. Uh, chrome plated cylinders, and I'm assuming we're talking about conventional channel chrome uh, cylinders, um, are kind of the opposite. They break in very slowly. Um, breaking in uh, uh, chrome cylinders, you, you basically aren't aren't uh, they don't they don't have a home pattern, um, and and what you're breaking in on those are the are the rings. The the situation is reversed. The 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 cylinder is plated with chrome, so it's super hard, and the rings are cast iron rings that are relatively soft. And the break in for chrome cylinders involves uh, basically breaking in the rings rather than breaking in the cylinder barrel, and it tends to take quite a while. And even under the best of circumstances, uh, the oil consumption won't be anywhere near as low as for a conventional steel cylinder or or a nickel carbide cylinder. Um, the good part about chrome cylinders is they don't rust and they wear like iron. The bad part is that, that they burn more oil and you just have to put up with that. John's wondering for preservation for long-term storage in the hangar is filling the engine completely with oil an option. I put a kiddies pool underneath to catch the leakage and replenish lost oil periodically. Cylinders were oiled and desiccant plugs and spark plug holes maintained. What are your thoughts? Yeah, well, I, I, I don't think it's it's necessary to fill it up completely. I, I think it, it, if, if you can't, um, if you can't uh, run the engine um, after you put in the, the the preservative oil, which if if the engine's sitting on a pallet, you probably can't run it. Then I think the best thing you can do is after you after you service it with the preservative oil is to is to flip it upside down once or twice just to get the oil on on everything you possibly can. I'm not sure I would. Fill it to the brim where it's leaking, um, 
but but it 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 certainly would be a good idea to uh, to to fill the the sump and then then rotate the engine a couple times to to make sure that lots of of that preservative oil get all over the top of the engine, and particularly on a Lycoming where the cam is up at the top. That's one of the most vulnerable components of the engine. So you want to make sure you get lots of oil on it. Donald's wondering, uh, is the first hour or two of break in cumulative time? For example, 20 minutes flying here, 30 minutes flying there? Um, yeah, sure it is. Um, but but again, if, if if you're making a bunch of landings during that first hour, then, then you're subjecting the engine as a necessity to more low power operation than would be optimal. I don't know of a good way of landing the airplane without throttling it back to low power. So um, the, preferably just fly the thing at high power for an hour, it would be the best. But yeah, yeah the, the hour is, is cumulative. Let's get a couple questions on the core. Uh, you were talking, what's included in the core? What components? Well, um, I mean that the, they normally expect an engine that that would be capable of running, <laughs> um, which, which means it, it doesn't have to have accessories like an alternator or uh, the things that don't that, that aren't required for engine operation. But they but there, it is expected to have uh, magnetos, um, th things that that the engine couldn't run if they weren't there. I think that's the basic rule. And Robert was wondering, does the core turned in for exchange need to be the same model as the one you are purchasing? Usually uh, that's the case. Um, certainly if you're, if, if, if you're having the engine overhauled, obviously it has to be the same, unless you ask the overhaul shop to, you know, convert it uh to to a to to a, a different dash number or something by substituting different parts um for um a factory rebuilt engine uh i i think it, it generally has to be the it's, it's it's supposed to be the same um the same model as as what you're uh as as what you're buying i it, there may be a little bit of wiggle room there but probably not very much all right, Mike. Well, uh, great presentation tonight. Thank you so much for these uh, tips and tricks for us. Uh, take a moment, share closing thoughts with everybody. It looks like we had about 600 people logged in. Yeah. Well, I, I don't. I don't really have any <laughs> any closing thoughts except that I I I think Home Builders Week is just a a, a great thing, and I'm really glad to be part of it uh, now for. This is this is the second year, I guess, isn't it? Second or third? Third year, third annual. Yep. Third, third year. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it, it it was inspired by COVID, I think, but it's it's uh, it, I think it's now turned into a permanent thing, and I, I think it's great. And I hope you have a spectacular 70th anniversary tomorrow. Oh, thank you so much, Mike. Uh, and same to you as an EAA member. It's your anniversary as well. It's Absolutely. it's all our anniversaries. Yes. Yes. I've been an EAA proud. member for as long as I can possibly remember. <laughs> right on. Hey, Chase, just got a great comment here for you. I'm going to end with this. But Mike, you're a national treasure for all us GA pilots and mechanics. Thank you for what you're doing. Well, that's very nice to say, Chase. Thank you very much. All right, everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, end of day three in Home Builders Week. Tomorrow we start off at 1130 with a special presentation. Uh, EAA uh, CEO Jack Cox and Home Built Community Manager Charlie Becker are talking about EAA's home built movement, the past accomplishments, and the future direction of home building. So that should be an interesting one. So hope you can tune in for that. That's going to start at 1130 Central Time. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Good night, everybody.